In part one of lecture 16, what we want to do is continue building on what we've already talked about with the kidney. Remember, so far we've talked about the formation of filtrate at the renal corpuscle, that is the combination of the capsule plus the glomerular capillaries. Now what we want to do is continue and talk about how that filtrate is processed in the proximal convoluted tubules, the nephron loop, the distal convoluted tubules, and finally the collecting duct. The main processes we're going to be discussing here will be reabsorption and secretion. This material is from Chapter 25 in Merit. Let's begin with a simplified overview of nephron function. This is where we've been already. Remember, we talked about how the filtrate is formed and how the filtration process is regulated. This filtrate is really the raw material that's going to be provided to the proximal convoluted tubule and the other parts of the nephron and is going to be processed and eventually is going to make urine. The next segment of the nephron is going to be the proximal convoluted tubule or PCT which is here. Remember these cells are specialized to reabsorb by virtue of the microvilla that they have on their surface. And you can see the arrows up here indicating reabsorption. Remember this is movement of filtrate from here outward. Now when the material makes it into the proximal convoluted tubule it's actually no longer called filtrate, it's now called tubular fluid and it will be called tubular fluid until it gets into the collecting duct and finally gets down here and eventually makes it out as urine. So the proximal convoluted tubule is really specialized for reabsorption as we'll see. It reabsorbs about 65 percent of all the volume of the filtrate that passes through it. So that's really its main job. It does however as you see here by virtue of this arrow have some capability for secretion. And Remember if we have blood vessels down here we're basically taking material from the blood vessels and moving them back into the tubules. This is the process of tubular secretion. The proximal convoluted tubule can carry out secretion, but its main job, as we'll see, is reabsorption. And then we have the distal convoluted tubule, which is indicated up here. And the distal convoluted tubule, we're going to talk about mainly the process of secretion. This does also carry out a bit of reabsorption, but its main function, as we'll see, is secretion. And finally, the very last segment that we're going to talk about is the collecting duct. Now, as we mentioned before, when we talked about kidney anatomy, the collecting duct is actually not part of the individual nephron. Collecting ducts receive input from multiple nephrons, as you see here. So we'd have a nephron contributing here, one contributing here, a couple down here. And what happens in the collecting duct is it actually provides us with the option of reclaiming water or letting it pass out of the body. Another way of saying this is that the collecting duct is what controls the final volume and solute concentration of the urine, as we'll see in a little while. So this is an overview slide as well. And we could talk about a couple of things here that I just mentioned in the summary graphic earlier. Filtration is the first process. Remember, this is creating the raw material that will be processed into urine. Filtration, as we said, is based primarily, but not entirely, on size. There is some electrical charge component. This occurs in the renal corpuscle. Remember, this is a combination of the glomerular capsule plus the glomerular capillaries. And this occurs across that three-step filtration membrane that we talked about earlier. So we have the fenestrated capillaries, the basement membrane that surrounds those capillaries, and finally the filtration slits that are formed by the, the visceral layer of the glomerular capsule and the podocytes. The next step is going to be nutrient and fluid reabsorption. And the reabsorption, as I just mentioned, occurs primarily in the proximal convoluted tubule, or PCT, this is a very important number for you to remember. 65% of the volume of the filtrate that enters the proximal convoluted tubule to become tubular fluid gets reabsorbed. So the bulk of reabsorption happens in the proximal convoluted tubule. And of course, all the substances that are in this volume of fluid that gets reabsorbed get reabsorbed as well. So we're talking about things like sodium, like glucose, and other ions that we'll talk about a little bit later. The rest of reabsorption occurs different places in the nephron loop, in the distal convoluted tubule, and somewhat in the collecting tubule, although as we said, the collecting tubule is mainly for the reabsorption of water. Secretion occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule, but primarily, as we'll talk about, in the distal convoluted tubule. And finally, as I just mentioned a little while ago, regulation of the final volume and solute concentration of urine is actually set up in the juxtamedullary nephron loops, but is finalized within the collecting ducts.
and so we'll talk about that a little later. This is a good overview slide after you're studying all this stuff and you want to just um, kind of come back and get an overall summary about what the individual parts of the nephron as well as the collecting ducts do. This is a great summary slide for that. Next what we'd like to do is get an overview of the nephron and collecting duct function in a graphical form. Just so you know I do have a tabular form of this later on in the presentation and as a review so much of the material that's on here is summarized in the table. I think that'll make it a little bit easier for you to remember for the purposes of the exam. But for now, what we'd like to use is this graphical summary to talk about the processes of reabsorption and secretion throughout the nephron. First of all, notice that there are a couple of boxes here. And the boxes are color-coded either in blue or in pink. The boxes that are in blue indicate tubular reabsorption occurring. The boxes that are in pink indicate tubular secretion. You'll also notice inside these boxes are certain items that are either being reabsorbed or secreted. Let's begin with the proximal convoluted tubule. As we said before, remember about 65% of all the reabsorption that occurs in the kidney in the nephron occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. So once again, this is an important number for you to remember. So as we say, the bulk of tubular reabsorption occurs in the PCT. Now, if you take a look at some of the items that are reabsorbed, you can see things like glucose, amino acids, proteins, obviously very valuable things to be reabsorbed into the body that we wouldn't want to lose in the urine. And we also have some substances that are processed a little bit differently, but are also reabsorbed, like lactate or lactic acid. Um, lactic acid is valuable because this really can be converted back into glucose. Urea and uric acid, we'll talk about the processing of these a little bit later. Now, if you look on the other side of this box, you'll see some very important ions that are reabsorbed as well at the PCT. Notice we have sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, bicarbonate, and water. So very important ions that we don't want to get rid of from the body that get reabsorbed from the proximal convoluted tubule back into the body that is back into the peritubular capillaries. Now, one of the things I want to mention here is something we talked about earlier, and that is that water follows salt or water follows solute. So you'll notice these three stars here next to sodium, next to chloride, and next to water. Pretty much as it says on the bottom here, wherever we move sodium, chloride and water usually follow. The chloride is what makes the salt, and the water usually follows the salt. So pretty much wherever we have reabsorption of sodium, you can assume that chloride and water is moving along with that. So really, we can lump these three ions into one thing. Some of the other important ions here are calcium, and down here you'll see bicarbonate. The bicarbonate, as you remember, is very important in several cellular reactions, also important, as we'll see later on, as a buffer in the body. Now let's take a look at the other side of the coin and look at some secretion that occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. Substances like creatinine, some drugs, and also, very importantly, we have hydrogen ion being secreted into the tubule. This is a great way for us to get rid of some of the excess acid that we want to eliminate in the urine. So the hydrogen ion is moved from the blood into the tubules and then gets excreted from the body in the form of the urine. Now, one thing I want you to note on here is the coloration in this diagram. This is going to be used throughout the images that we're going to look at. Notice that here the coloration in yellow is a little bit lighter than it is all the way down the bottom, for example, of the nephron loop. What this is indicating in the diagram is increasing solute concentration by darkening of the color. In other words, there's less solute concentration up here in the proximal convoluted tubule, more solute concentration down here in the bottom of the nephron loop. And by solutes, we're really mainly talking about sodium as well as urea. So these are the two primary solutes that are going to change the color on these diagrams that you're going to see. And if you remember, we also talked about the fact that we have the corticomedullary junction right about here. So this part of the nephron, the proximal convoluted tubule, the distal convoluted tubule, the renal corpuscle, these are all in the cortex. And if you remember, the bottom down here is in the medulla of the kidney. So you'll notice once again that the nephron loop dips down into the medulla. Some of these nephron loops are extremely long in the juxtamedullary nephrons, as we talked about earlier. So keep this in mind as you look at the coloration of this. And let's talk a little bit about the nephron loop. Once again, in the nephron loop, we have two limbs. We have a descending limb, and we also have an ascending limb. 
Notice in the thin portion of the descending limb, what we're basically reabsorbing here is water. And I want you to notice that in this box we don't have any sodium, we don't have any chloride. That's because primarily we're reabsorbing water without sodium and chloride. So what's happening basically is we're taking water away from a solution, leaving behind the sodium and chloride. What's going to happen to the solute concentration? Sure, it's going to become more concentrated. And you notice that the coloration here is increasing or getting darker as we go down toward the bottom of this loop. That's an indication that we are actually taking water out and increasing the concentration. You'll also notice that some urea is added by tubular secretion into the fluid in the bottom of this nephron loop that also increases the concentration of solutes. Now let's take a look at the ascending limb of the nephron loop and look at this section right here. Notice what's getting reabsorbed that I'm tracing out right here is sodium, potassium, and chloride. What don't we see? Right? We don't see any water. In fact, this is one of the places in the nephron where water cannot follow salt or cannot follow solute. So in other words, there are salt pumps in the ascending limb of the nephron loop, and these are specialized to pump out sodium, potassium, chloride, but water is prevented from moving out of the tubule. So what are we doing here? Well, basically we're taking salt out of a solution but leaving the water behind. What's going to happen to the concentration or the osmolarity of the solution is it's going to go down. And you'll notice the coloration once again. Here we're going from a dark color to a lighter color as we get back toward the cortex once again. So this is indicating that we're basically diluting the solution in the ascending limb of the nephron loop so that up in the top right here at the beginning of the distal convoluted tubule we basically will have a very very dilute solution. Now I want you to keep this in mind. This is going to be important later on when we talk about regulating the final volume and solute concentration of the urine. Let's take a look at the distal convoluted tubule and you'll notice that we have some more reabsorption of, you guessed it, sodium, chloride, water. Remember these things can be lumped together and we also reabsorb some more bicarbonate, some of this very important substance that we use as a buffer and in some cellular reactions. Notice what's getting secreted down here. At the very distal portion of the distal convoluted tubule, beginning of the collecting duct, we can actually secrete some more hydrogen ion, potassium ion, as well as ammonium. These are substances that we really don't want in the body, or that if we have excess of, we want to get rid of. So as we said, one of the most important things that occurs in the distal convoluted tubule is the secretion of these different things. And finally, let's take a quick look at the collecting duct. We're going to come back to this in a little while. I want you to notice the coloration here. We go from light yellow here, and as we move down the collecting duct, notice what's happening to the coloration. It's becoming darker. So what are we doing? Sure, we're concentrating the solution. How are we doing that? Well, what's happening down here is we're reabsorbing water as well as the urea. And I want you to take a look at the urea. What happens to the urea is we reabsorb here, and then we secrete here. So this basically goes around in a loop down the bottom. And the urea is one of the things that's important in concentrating the fluid in the tubules of the nephron loop and in the collecting duct. And we're going to talk about that a little later and why that's done. But notice that water is being reabsorbed. This is one of those places where water can be reabsorbed either to a great extent or to a very small extent, depending on the needs of the body. And if you think about what we said before about the collecting duct, remember that the collecting duct is really the regulator of the final volume and solute concentration of the urine. And one of the ways it does this is by regulating how much water we release from the body or how much water we retain by absorption. Okay, so now that we've had a little bit of an overview of the functions of the nephron and where each of these processes take place, Let's take a closer look at a couple of individual processes. Let's start with tubular reabsorption. Just to remind you then, tubular reabsorption and secretion. These are the two processes that we talked about earlier, very, very important. Remember that tubular reabsorption is reclaiming of substances that are in the filtrate already back into the body. In other words, we're moving things from the tubule back into the blood. And you see that indicated on the left here. So we're taking things from the filtrate, moving them back into the body. However, secretion is the opposite process, which is indicated on the other side of this slide. Remember that this is the elimination of substances by the body that didn't leave the blood 
at the glomerulus. In other words, these are things that didn't make it into the filtrate, but we do want to get rid of more of these, and we can accomplish that through tubular secretion. Okay, let's talk about an important concept called renal clearance. The definition from your book, which I think is a good one, is right here. This is uh, the volume of plasma from which the kidneys clear a particular substance in a given time, and usually this is based on one minute. So before we actually talk about the definition, let's talk about a number that we already know from our previous lectures, and this is the glomerular filtration rate. If you remember, this was equal to 125 milliliters per minute. And remember that this is the amount of filtrate formed by all the nephrons in both kidneys every minute. Now imagine if in the urine we have an amount of substance that's equal to the amount that was present in that 125 milliliters of filtrate that came from the plasma. Well this would mean that in the urine we're basically eliminating all of that substance from that particular volume which was 125 milliliters. So this would be basically cleared from the body. What we could call that is renal clearance. Now let's take a look at the mathematical formula for this, which is used to calculate this in some clinical situations. The renal clearance of something is measured in milliliters per minute and is equal to the urine concentration in milligrams per milliliter multiplied by the rate of urine formation, which is expressed in milliliters per minute, all divided by the plasma concentration measured once again in milligrams per milliliter. Now what we're essentially doing here if you take a look at the equation is we're comparing the urine concentration of something to its plasma concentration. Effectively saying that if we find all of something in the urine that we found in the plasma the kidneys have cleared all of that. So the renal clearance would be essentially 100%. This will become a little bit clearer as we go down and talk about some of the things that are in the lower portion of the slide. Let's continue on with this. Now when we talk about the renal clearance of something, we abbreviate that something here or we put a subscript here to indicate what that substance is. For example, you can see how we abbreviate the renal clearance of inulin. We put inulin down here as a subscript. So let's talk about inulin first. Now realize this is not insulin. This is inulin, this is a plant polysaccharide that we can inject into the body and it will be completely cleared from the body in the urine. In other words, 100% of this will be filtered, none of it will be reabsorbed, none of it will be secreted by the kidneys. So any of this that we have in the plasma will wind up in the urine without any processes um, contributed by the nephrons, for example, reabsorption and secretion. So we can base a clearance test on this, which we call an inulin clearance test. And this is a good one because the clearance of inulin works out to be exactly the same as the normal glomerular filtration rate of 125 milliliters per minute. So we say that the clearance of inulin is equal to the glomerular filtration rate which is 125 milliliters per minute. That's why this is used as a standard test for assessing glomerular filtration rate. Now we can also do this a little bit more easily with creatinine. Remember that creatinine is a breakdown product basically of creatine that's present in muscle and that recharges ADP into ATP. Creatinine is completely filtered at the kidney and once again none of this is reabsorbed but a little bit of it is secreted but not too much of it. And so what basically happens is that pretty much all the creatinine that makes it into the filtrate will be seen in the urine. And so what we have is the clearance of creatinine is about 140 milliliters per minute. Now you realize that this is a little bit more than our normal GFR of 125 milliliters per minute. So it does overestimate GFR by just a little bit. But the fact that it's so easy to do makes it a very nice test to use to get an initial evaluation of renal function. We don't have to inject anything and it's easy to measure the concentration in the plasma and the urine. So the creatinine test is a very easy test to do and it approximates GFR pretty well. We can also use other substances, one of which is called paraaminohyperic acid or PAH and we can do that as a renal clearance test as well. All of these tests basically, this is important for you to realize, the renal clearance that we're talking about here and the tests that we do to assess renal clearance are all important because they can be used to calculate glomerular filtration rate in a patient. So especially the inulin clearance test is a good guideline to see if a patient's kidneys are functioning the way they should. Let's look at a couple of examples. Hopefully these will clear things up for you a little bit. Remember we said above that if we find in the urine all of this substance 
that we had in 125 milliliters of plasma or filtrate, that 100% of that substance was being cleared. So essentially we can say that if a clearance of something is 125 milliliters per minute, that means that 125 milliliters of this substance is removed from the plasma every minute, or we can say that the clearance is 100%. And we kind of said that above in the beginning of the slide. Now let's look at the case where the renal clearance of the substance is 60 milliliters per minute. Well, this is about half of the normal 125 milliliters per minute glomerular filtration rate. What this indicates is that some reabsorption of X is occurring. In other words, we won't find all of this in the urine in the same amount that we found in the plasma. We'll find about half of it. And this means, if you look at this number, about half of this substance is being reabsorbed. In fact, this is about the renal clearance for urea, and we're going to talk about urea a little bit later. If we had another substance and its renal clearance was zero milliliters per minute, what this is saying is that we don't find any of this in the urine, and so effectively what's happening is we're having complete reabsorption of substance X. This, for example, would be the renal clearance of glucose, because under normal circumstances, all of the glucose that makes it into the filtrate is eventually reabsorbed by the body and none of it appears in the urine. So effectively the renal clearance of glucose is zero and we don't want to clear the glucose out of the plasma remember because this is an important molecule we want to keep this in the body. Now what about the other side of the coin here if we find something that has a renal clearance of about 630 milliliters per minute? Well obviously this is greater than the normal GFR of 125 milliliters per minute, this means that somehow more of this substance is making it into the urine than initially made it into the filtrate. And we call that secretion, if you remember. So if we find a renal clearance where the clearance is higher than the normal glomerular filtration rate, this means that some secretion of substance X is occurring. Now this may take a little bit of thinking about in order to understand this, but this really is an important concept, uh, both clinically and it's an important concept physiologically for you to understand. Well, let's talk a little bit more about tubular reabsorption. This is a selective process. In other words, the tubule cells that surround the filtrate carry out these separate processes of, for example, diffusion, osmosis, carrier-mediated transport. So now we're talking about proteins actually transporting solutes and substances across the cell membranes. And this can be accomplished by facilitated diffusion, by active transport, Remember, this is going to involve energy in the form of ATP, and also by co- and counter-transport. Co-transport means moving things in the same direction, counter-transport moving things in the opposite direction. As we said, this occurs mainly in the proximal convoluted tubules, which absorb about 65% of the volume of the filtrate. Now, one other point I want to make is to talk about something that's known as a transport maximum, or T sub M. We have this for most substances besides sodium. It's very hard for the kidneys to get overwhelmed with sodium because they're so good at transporting it. But for most other substances, we have a maximum amount that we can actually reabsorb back into the body. And this is known as a transport maximum. The definition of this is the rate at which solutes can be transported by the tubular cells. For example, for glucose, the transport maximum is 375 milligrams per minute. Every minute, then, all the tubules in both kidneys can transport a maximum of 375 milligrams of glucose back into the body. Once we exceed this transport maximum, the kidney cells are overwhelmed and that glucose will basically appear in the urine. Now, we have another way of indicating this as well, which is a little bit more clinically relevant. This is what's known as a renal threshold. The definition is slightly different. This is the plasma level, or the concentration, above which a particular solute will appear in the urine. For glucose, for example, we talk about a threshold of about 180 milligrams per deciliter. Notice this is a concentration where we have an amount of solute in a given volume of solvent. And what this basically says is that if the plasma concentration of glucose was to exceed 180 milligrams per deciliter, the rest of that glucose would appear in the urine because it would not have a chance to be reabsorbed by the tubular cells. So as an example, if we had a concentration of 200 milligrams per deciliter of glucose in the plasma, we would see 20 milligrams per deciliter of glucose appear in the urine because the tubular cells could only reabsorb 180 milligrams per deciliter. That's their maximum. The other 20 milligrams per deciliter 
would basically overflow, so to speak, into the urine and would appear outside the body. Now, the other thing we want to talk about is why are the peritubular capillaries so well suited for reabsorption? We're going to look at this graphically in a second. Well, let's just talk about the reasons for this. First of all, in the peritubular capillaries, we have a low hydrostatic pressure. Remember that hydrostatic pressure is the force that tends to push fluid out of the capillaries. When this pressure is lower, fluid tends to be retained in the capillaries. So because we want to accept substances into the capillaries rather than push them out, having a low hydrostatic pressure here serves this purpose. The second thing is that we have a high degree of permeability. The spaces between the endothelial cells are a little bit bigger, and so these capillaries are better suited to reabsorbing substances. And finally, we have a higher colloid pressure due to filtration at the glomerulus. What does this mean? Well, remember we had proteins that were left behind in the glomerular capillaries because they were too big to escape into the capsule. And when those proteins make it out the other side of the glomerulus, that is out from the efferent arteriole, we've removed a lot of water and hence concentrated those proteins in the plasma of the blood that's leaving the glomerulus. So we've increased the colloid osmotic pressure due to filtration in the glomerulus. These things are illustrated here. Let's just talk about these first before we actually talk about the tubular cells. Notice those three different characteristics of the peritubular capillaries, one of which is indicated right here. There's a low hydrostatic pressure in here of about 8 millimeters of mercury. I think you'll appreciate by now, having seen the systemic capillaries, glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, that this is a relatively low hydrostatic pressure. This tends not to move fluid out of the peritubular capillaries. The second thing we mentioned is that these are more permeable. In other words, what we have here is larger spaces between the endothelial cells, making it easier for substances to make it back into the peritubular capillaries. And the last thing we just talked about was that these have a higher colloid osmotic pressure because of the increased concentration of proteins in the peritubular capillaries. Okay, so let's take a look at how reabsorption occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. I have a tabular slide of this graphic in the next slide, so you'll be able to kind of see these things in summary form in a table format, which is, I think is a little bit easier to look at. But I'd like to explain these things in graphical form on this slide. First of all, just to set this up, this is the tubular fluid that's over here. So this would be the fluid that will eventually become urine as flowing past the tubular cells, which you'll see right here. And then inside the tubular cells, we have the interstitial fluid here. And then finally, we have the peritubular capillary that we just talked about here. Now the job, if you remember, of the proximal convoluted tubule cells is to take materials from here, that is from the tubular fluid, bring it back through the cells, and eventually bring it back into the capillaries that are back here. And that's what we want to talk about in this slide, exactly how this is done. First of all, you notice a couple of different pathways that we have. You'll see that some of the substances are actually taken through the cells, processed in the cells, and then pushed out the other side of the cells. Eventually, these make it into the peritubular capillaries. So this is basically a transcellular route, and you'll notice that name down here. We have one other route of passage of some substances, though, and that is what's called a paracellular route. In other words, this route takes substances between the cells. Now, this sounds kind of silly, but these junctions that we have that connect the tubular cells are tight junctions, but they're leaky tight junctions. Kind of sounds weird. But in any case, what happens is these junctions do allow some water to pass from in here through these junctions and back into here. And what happens is when this water flows between the cells, it actually drags these solutes along with it. Imagine you're cleaning up after a meal, and in the water that's left in the sink from cleaning the dishes, you have a lot of solid stuff as well. Well, when you open the drain up, what happens is the water starts going down the drain, but what it does is drag those solid things to the drain as well. Same kind of principle here. This is something that's known as solvent drag. In other words, the water is just dragging these substances. And that's one route. The main thing we want to concentrate on in this slide, though, is the transcellular route. How do these cells take substances from the tubular fluid and bring them back through the cells and ultimately get them into the peritubular capillaries? Well, notice this red box right here. And notice that this is a counter-transport mechanism, something that's also called an antiport. Notice that what we're doing is we're pumping sodium out of the cell and we're moving potassium back into the cell from the interstitial fluid. 
Now this is an active transport pump and the reason it's an active transport pump is because we have a higher concentration of sodium out here and a lower concentration of sodium inside and so to move sodium from here out to here takes energy. This is going against the concentration gradient. The same thing is true for potassium. We have a high concentration of potassium inside the cell. We have a very low concentration of potassium outside the cell. So to move potassium from here to here takes energy because this is going against the concentration gradient. So this is an active transport pump which uses the energy of ATP. This is actually the primary place that sets up the gradients that drag or pull all these other substances through this cell. So this is called a primary active transport pump and it uses the energy of ATP. They happen to have the same letters which is convenient. That'll help you remember these. So what happens is this pump becomes active, uses the energy of ATP to move sodium out of the cell. That creates a, a little bit of a deficiency of sodium inside the cell and you notice here that sodium can then be pulled through this port over here into the cell because of the deficiency that we've established from this pump over here. So we basically created a sodium vacuum inside the cell through the action of this pump that pulls sodium back. And this is a very, very important point. The pulling of sodium through these pumps or through these channels, I should say, is coupled with the transport of most other things that we pull through these cells. In other words, it's the sodium concentration gradient that we set up that pulls all the other substances through these cells. Very, very important for you to understand. So if the sodium pump were to fail, the reabsorption of all these other substances wouldn't take place. So this is really one of the primary mechanisms that we have to reabsorb sodium and the other substances in the tubular cells. Notice what happens to some of these substances. We have, for example, glucose, amino acids, lactate, phosphate. All of these things are reabsorbed here and eventually make it back into the peritubular capillaries. We pull water in addition to these things, so some water, potassium, chloride, all these things make it back into the peritubular capillaries as well. Some of the other things that make it into these cells, for example, you'll see proteins. Now, we normally don't have too many proteins leak out at the filtration membrane, as we said before, but occasionally we do. These proteins are very valuable to the body. So what happens is the tubular cells take these proteins by endocytosis into the cell, fuse them with lysosomes, break them down into the component amino acids, and then the amino acids are shipped back into the peritubular capillary so that they can make it back into the body. One other thing we want to talk about here is reabsorption of bicarbonate. If you remember, this is one of the primary substances that we want to reabsorb as well. But we don't have any direct mechanism to reabsorb bicarbonate and pull it through the tubular cells. Instead, there's an indirect conversion process, and this is coupled to the reaction that we've talked about several times in the course already. The bicarbonate ion that's in the tubular fluid combines with hydrogen ion in the tubular fluid. This creates carbonic acid, and the carbonic acid then dissociates into water and carbon dioxide gas. The carbon dioxide is now pulled into the cells Notice what happens once this carbon dioxide makes it into the cell. Carbon dioxide fuses with water to form carbonic acid. This dissociates into bicarbonate ion and hydrogen. The hydrogen ion is then pulled back out here to make more CO2. In turn, the bicarbonate is then pulled back this way so that it can get reabsorbed into the interstitial capillaries. So this is an indirect mechanism of bicarbonate reabsorption Ultimately, what happens, though, is we take bicarbonate from the tubular fluid and move it back into the capillaries, even though it is kind of an indirect mechanism. Now, one of the things I want to call your attention is on the bottom here. That is that all the uric acid, about 50% of urea, and no creatinine is reabsorbed. These are just some facts I want you to keep in mind about tubular reabsorption. The other thing I want to mention that we talked about before, remember that 65% of filtrate volume is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules. This is the table I promised you and this is a summary of what we just talked about in the graphic slide here. And as we said the primary active transport that is the primary place for things to happen here is with the pumping of sodium creating a sodium gradient across the cell so that we can move other substances. And as it says over here this is important for you to remember sodium reabsorption is the driving force for the reabsorption of most other substances.
And you can see some of the other facts that are on here. These are things that we just talked about in the previous slide, so I won't go into any detail about these. If you want, you can back up the video, go back to the previous slide, print this table out, and have it alongside and make some notes if you like as you go through that um, previous slide. Now I want to make a point about sodium and water filtration, reabsorption, and excretion. I want you to take a look at the tremendous amounts of water and sodium that are filtered every day at the kidney. We know, of course, that we certainly don't eliminate 180 liters per day of water. We normally eliminate, on average, about 1.8 liters. Take a look also at the sodium, which we really haven't talked about yet. 630 grams of sodium is filtered by both kidneys every day. Just to give you an idea about how much this is, one of those boxes of salt that you buy in the store, the sodium chloride that you buy in the store, contains about 720 grams of sodium chloride. That should give you an indication about how much sodium we're actually talking about. That's quite a bit of sodium. Notice, though, that what's eliminated in the urine is only about 3.2 grams of sodium per day. That's like maybe a teaspoon. That's one teaspoon out of that whole box of salt that's eliminated. And that means that the kidneys are doing a tremendous job at reabsorbing the sodium. The other point that I want to make here is indicated on the bottom. Since these volumes are so tremendously large, it only takes a very small change in the volumes that are filtered in order to affect a pretty big change in the amount that's excreted every day. Now let's talk a little bit about tubular secretion and we'll be finished. Tubular secretion, as we know, is moving things from the peritubular capillaries into the tubules. In other words, what we're doing here is getting rid of additional things from the body that we don't want. So we can, for example, rid the body of excess potassium. We can also control blood pH by eliminating excess hydrogen ion. Let's take a look at secretion in the distal convoluted tubule. This is a very important mechanism, and you've got to really know this mechanism and understand it a little bit. First of all, reabsorption of sodium in the distal convoluted tubule is increased by the hormone aldosterone. We looked at aldosterone in the endocrine lectures, and if you remember, aldosterone is one of the primary salt reabsorbing hormones. And now we get a chance to look at how exactly this works. So let's take a closer look at this. We are in the distal convoluted tubule, as it says here. Okay, so we're looking at a portion of the distal convoluted tubule. And here, of course, we have tubular fluid flowing through the distal convoluted tubule. Notice the sodium ions in the tubular fluid coming into this area that we're talking about. Here we have the peritubular capillaries that are waiting to either get things reabsorbed or waiting to secrete things. What happens here is that under the influence of aldosterone, sodium reabsorption from the tubule into the peritubular capillaries is increased. But it turns out that for every ion of sodium that we reabsorb, we secrete either a potassium or a hydrogen ion, depending on what the body needs to get rid of more. If there's too much potassium in the body, potassium will preferentially be secreted. If there's too much acid in the body, too much hydrogen ion, hydrogen ion will preferentially be secreted. But one of the important points that you need to know here is that for every sodium ion that goes this way, we have either a potassium or a hydrogen ion go this way. So these are coupled. And that's very important for you to understand. The more aldosterone that we have secreted, the more sodium we'll reabsorb, but at the same time, the more potassium or the more hydrogen ion we will secrete and excrete. Some of the other compounds that we can actively secrete would be things like histamine, which you might want to get rid of, ammonia, which is harmful to the body as we talked about, creatinine, penicillin, phenobarbital, these kind of things. It's a very similar mechanism to what we see here. These are actively secreted substances. But this is a very important point here. This is a very active sodium pump that's aldosterone dependent. Keep in mind that for every ion of sodium we reabsorb, we secrete and excrete either potassium or hydrogen in exchange. Okay, so that finishes up part one of lecture 16. I'll see you soon for part two of lecture 16, where we'll start talking about regulating the final volume and solute concentration of the urine. See you then.